Let's talk about friction. We've already discussed the fact that it's parallel to the surface. That if I take a general push, one at say 53 degrees, I can break that up into a perpendicular push, we call the normal force, and a parallel push that involves the nooks and crannies of my hand grabbing the nooks and crannies of the table. And that force has to act parallel to the surface. It turns out that this force comes in two flavors. We call them static and kinetic. With static friction, there's no relative motion between the surfaces. If I push on this smart podium and it doesn't go anywhere, there's a friction force that is acting uh, so, so that I can't move it, okay? Now, kinetic friction, you can hear if you listen. You can hear the scraping going on. Now, this is what physicists call them, static and kinetic. I call them hard and easy. This kinetic friction that we're going to talk about today turns out to be just brutally simple. The static friction is one of the most challenging of all the forces. And so we'll tackle that on Friday. Now, let's talk about this kinetic friction. I slide this, and you can hear the scraping going on, that is the friction. What should that friction depend on? What is it about this crate or this floor that would determine how big that friction force is? I'm going to give you a hint. It's not the color of the crate. So what else might it be? Talk to your neighbor. See if your neighbor can sort this out. Okay, brave soul, raise your hand and share. What might it depend on? Where are you? Yes, sir. Uh, surface area. Surface area. Okay, what else? Is there a hand over here? Yes. The normal force. Okay, what else? Over here. The coefficient, uh, how rough the surfaces are. Okay, what else? Mass. The mass. Anything else? The, uh, the accelerator gravity. Oh, the acceleration of gravity? Okay, what planet we're on? What else? It turns out that to my mind, it should depend on all of these things. All of these things are very, very reasonable. And yet, it turns out that nature has given us a gift that is just fabulous. Nature has created a force that is so simple that it only, only depends on two things. How rough the surfaces are, whether I've got a hockey puck on ice or whether I've got sandpaper on wood, what the surfaces are like. And the second thing it depends on is how tightly those surfaces are pressed together or the normal force. And that's it. That's it. Now, I... I don't know why it doesn't depend on those other things. I can venture a guess. I mean, I think it should depend on the surface area. If I think of this book, what I'm saying here suggests that I'm going to have the same friction force whether I slide the book that way or whether I slide the book that way. Because the normal force is going to be the same and the surfaces are the same. But if I slide it this way, it seems like I've got more nooks and crannies to interact with the table. That should have more friction, I think. Would you mind if I push on your arm with just uh, five newtons, one pound of force? Would that be okay? Sure. Still okay? <laughs> Maybe not. A push of five newtons or one pound would be negligible if I spread it out over the surface of my hand. But if you've been to the doctor office, you know that that same one pound of force, of the, you know, if it's all concentrated on the tip of a needle, that hurts, okay? And, uh, and so that's the difference between force and pressure. Pressure is 
how much force there is per unit area. Now, if I use that idea with this book, when the book is sliding like that, I have more surface area, so I have more nooks and crannies. But the normal force is spread out over a bigger area. The pressure is less. Those nooks and crannies aren't pushed into the table as much. When I slide this this way, um, I have fewer nooks and crannies, but now the same normal force is confined to a much smaller area. The pressure is greater. Those nooks and crannies are squeezed into each other more. And it just so happens, we're lucky, those two effects cancel out. Now, <laughs> quick story. Many, many years ago, my wife decided to take this class just for fun. And we decided that we wouldn't tell any of the students. She went to the tutorial, uh, she came to lectures, and we got away with it for a while. No one knew she was my wife. Then there was this uh, Valentine's Day dance out at the uh, Gallatin Gateway Inn. And my wife and I just loved ballroom dancing, and we were just swinging around, having a great time, and every time we went around, there was a student from the class, and we just, oh, dang, caught again, caught again. And so I was embarrassed. The very next lecture was this one on friction. And then when I got to this point, my wife's hand went up in the back, and I thought, this can't be good. My wife's questions are very, very hard. And she said, Professor, if what you say is true, why is it that when I sand down the wheels on my son's Pinewood Derby car to a point, he wins. Now I knew what the answer was. It has nothing to do with friction. It has everything to do with rotational inertia, which we're going to cover the last week of class. I didn't want to go there, so I decided it was time to fess up. And I said, well, that would be my son's Pinewood Derby car, car as well. Class, I have to confess, I'm sleeping with one of the students in the... <laughs> she is the mother of my four children, and we've been married for 20 years at the time, now 35. Anyway, um, what they were interested in was that she was not getting a grade for the class, so that would be important. So, it's true. It only depends on these two things. Only on these two things.